Fletcher Chu from Youth Lead, um, Kalista Biakula from Youth Voices Count, and Lakey Shrink from YP Asia Pacific. So just kindly reminding that so each speaker has only five minutes. So let's start. Uh, let's get started from Fletcher Chu and. He is an HIV advocate of PRAA um, and a person living with HIV Right Advocacy Association in Taiwan. And Fletcher was also involved and empowered by Treat Asia's uh, Youth ACAT program. And he currently sits as a board chair of Youth Lead, the Asia Pacific Network of Young Key Population. So I would like to ask you to share more with us about the young people leaving the HIV response in Asia and the Pacific and expectations for high level meeting. So over to you, uh, Fletcher. Thank you, Ligi. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thanks for having me in this dialogue. Hi everyone, my name is Fletcher Chiu. I'm based in Taiwan and I currently sit as board chair of Youth Lead. So with setting the scene this part, I will quickly go through three topics with you. Um, first is the current epidemic among young people and young key population in our region. And second will be some examples of young people leading the HIV response in the country level and also in the regional level. And last point would be some expectation from the high level meeting from youth perspective. So first, as the data shows that young people made up 23.7% of the world's population in 2021. And many young people still report an adequate knowledge of HIV prevention, as well as pro access to comprehensive sexuality education, as well as sexual and reproductive health services. As we can see in 2019 in Asia Pacific region, a total of 420,000 young people aged 15 to 24 was living with HIV. And in the same year, there were 82,000 new HIV infection among young people, which represent 27% of all new HIV infection. And among this, young MSN accounts for 52% of all new infection among youth and overall 99% of new HIV infection among young people are key populations and their partners. And there are still 5,408 related deaths in this year. And a tax review done, done by Youth Lead and Youth Lead Partner indicates that more than 50% of young key population, including MSN, transgender, and people who inject drugs do not have access to HIV testing in the past year. So these numbers are just tips of the iceberg and they describe that Asia Pacific region ex experiencing an HIV rebound, which is greatly affecting young key populations and more actions are needed to, be, are needed to address the concentrated epidemic, especially for challenging environment in certain countries. So while we all understand that there are a lot more we can do and we have to do, so moving on to the second part with examples from young people leading the HIV response, which demonstrate young people's capability to tackle the issues. So we are all aware that community-led services are preferred by young key population and, and, and it leverage the uptake of HIV services and meets the unique need of young key population. For example, uh, Focus Muda and the National Network of Young Key Population in Indonesia, they use different social media platforms such as YouTube channel, podcast, raise awareness to really get the message to, to the community. And one of their program calls I'm Buddies, where they accompany minors to access HIV testing to address the issues on age of consent for testing. Another example in the Philippines, at the organization Cebu Plus, with the purchase of a mobile testing van, provided service delivery to hard to reach young key populations, even past the stand office hour, so that young people were able to access HIV services without missing school or work, and it's available until late hours in the evening. So when young people in the country level are um, striving for a differential service delivery to cater the needs of young key population, regional organization like Youth Lead, Youth Voice Count, Y Peers, access to support to various youth-led organizations on capacity development, funding opportunity, while assessing large donor funds remains a challenge for smaller youth-led organization and network with limited capacity and experience. So above information shows that young people and young key population 
can be the expert of our own needs. But with the political wellness and real action plan, we can achieve more as partners. What we want to see reflected in the political declarations are comprehensive psychosocial, economic, and health support for young key population. It can start with um, the basic to include the terms young key population, which differs from young people or key population, to recognize the distinctions among young, pe young key population, young people, and adult key population. Also, the structural barriers remain big issues. Young people demand decriminalization of drug and sex worker and repeal of all laws that breach on the rights of young LGBTQI people. And also laws that act as, act as barrier to assessing HIV testing, treatment and prevention, such as uh, the age of consent for testing, as well as laws limiting access to harm reduction services criminalization of HIV non-disclosure, exposure and transmission must be repelled without daily. To make this happen, young people and young key population to be engaged in delegation to influence the high level meeting language with the government to really enable meaningful engagement is the key. We expect our response to ending AIDS should not only be a public health response, but a societal holistic response because vulnerable community, including young key population's life is not just about HIV. So I will stop here and thank you all again for this opportunity to speak on this issue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Fletcher. Thank you so much. It's been so incredible. So we happily will get back to you if get any question from the audience. So the next panelist is a Kalisito Wakula from Youth Voices Con, and they is identifies as a Wakasa Leva Leva, um, and indigenous identity referring to persons who identify beyond the gender binary, and they are human rights defender from the Fiji Islands. Currently working um, as a technical support staff of Youth Voices Con, they are also pursuing the International Age Society digital innovative to support you, uh, young leaders. So my question will be for you is how stigma and discrimination is impacting uh, the HIV response and why addressing intersectional is, is a critical as we move forward ending AIDS by 2030. So over to you, Kalisita. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. To, I would like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to be part of the discussion, be part of the, this panel discussion, and also to give a space for the a voice for the Pacific. But I would like, at first, I would like to start pointing out how religion and culture play a huge role uh, in in young people's lives, in especially young people who in the region, and. Also, we can also recognize, also rec by recognize that culture and religion play an uh, important part, especially in discussion on sex, gender, sexuality, and sexual health and HIV. And we have, uh, I've, I've, we have noticed, and also if, uh, in, we know that it exists that the topic around sex is a taboo, like a, a very, and we've, it's very deep, which makes it difficult for parents at home and even adults to have this conversation about sex with their children. And at times there's a like a, like a big pushback from communities on from communities on sex on sex education in schools, which has led to a, has met, let many young people resort uh, get it, turn into the internet for answers. And you have seen that the the with the power of technology, many young people has used has has used the internet to get answers and how this, especially accessing pornography sites, uh, which is which is and also we see that unrealistic, uh, unsafe uh, sexual practices as where young people or uh, begin to experiment and also accept uh, also accessing sexual practice health and rights services has become more difficult, especially when your condition at the early age, especially the sharing information about your sex life is like, we've made it feel like it is wrong. And I think that is one of the, I believe that has led to many young people do not, and adults that do not uh, access these services because if they, because of the sensitive question being asked by, uh, 
in arts at these, at these facilities. And also with Sochi as being reaccepted in the Pacific, we have noticed the stigmatization of LGBTIQ communities, which further make it a, a LGBT individual uh, not accessing these SDI screening services of like being charged of their of this choice of sexual engagement, which also leads as an act of discrimination, abuse, and violence. And we have noted uh, also, uh, we have noticed that the socioeconomic status of social economic status has also played a, a large, a big role, especially in the HIV response, where in low income and low literacy communities do not understand the technical terms used by the HIV response and also the uh, by the HIV response was it become very technical. And with the region where it's like uh, a diverse region where we are used to community, we live in community living, especially in rural setting, we have noticed that geography is also a factor that limits young people uh, accessing the SRHR services and many young people wait to the pros and the cons that in accessing these health services against the cost. And the Pacific region holds, uh, since we were uh, former colonies of, uh, former colony of these, uh, of different, the, the big empires in the world, empires such as Great Britain, the US, France, and we have noticed that there's a number of you know, laws such as decriminalizing same-sex relation from, and also decriminalizing sex work and, and travel restriction for people with living with HIV, these, which fuel stigma and discrimination amongst young key population, also increasing the barriers of much HIV uh, services. And as a young transgender non-confirming member of part of the panel, I would like to take this opportunity to also speak about the address of violence and hate crimes against the LGBT community. I just recent, over the weekend, a recent member of a, the top, member of the community from the, from Tongan, who was brutal and we call, we, I would like to call for justice for the brutal murder, murder of, uh, of, of uh, Oli Kefu uh, from the, Tong, uh, the, the president of the Tongan Lady Association who was murdered in, who was murdered over the weekend. Uh, whose, whose his body was found just a few meters away from his home. And then I also mentioned this in space, was in order to achieve the HIV target and to fulfill the goals of a collective response, we need to acknowledge that the community, uh, that the LGBT communities are always at the front line of human rights violation and hate crimes. And now I would like to also address the intersectionality, the why it is critical for addressing uh, intersectionality as we move towards the end of uh, AIDS by 2030. Uh, I would like to ensure, we're like, we need, really need to ensure that there's an intersectional and intergenerational and human rights based approach in achieving gender equality and empowerment of young people in all our diversities across the region and also fully recognizing the principle of do no harm and leave one no behind. And there's a need to consult all communities in the region. And we really need to really decolonize the conversation around gender sexuality as we need to embrace the, the diverse identities in the region and there's a huge gap of political will that we really need to worry for inclusive discussion on policy making and planning response on HIV and AIDS and we're always seeing that intersectionality is always revealed the both the intersection of intersectional inter institution and system that categorize that produce oppression intersectional identities categorized within the individual and groups and the multi layers of identities and risks often dedicate, dedicate, dedicate the vulnerabilities such as, to, as to HIV and AIDS and human rights violation based on our SOGS. And therefore, ongoing, I would like to I would let us bear in mind that we must protect the most marginalized of the marginalized and provide services at the most risk population within the risk population and also protect the, the rights at the, of the most discriminated within the oppressed sectors. And from that, a big knock of a Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing, Kalisita, and that was so meaningful for us. So we're moving to another um, speaker um, who's Lakey Shring from YPO Asia Pacific. And he's from Bhutan and is passion social advocate with more than seven years of experience in field of SRHR. 
and he has voluntarily served with young people at both in the country and the global levels. Um, currently, Lakey is the one of the international coordinator of YPR Asia and the Pacific and was previously the national coordinator of YPR Bhutan. By profession, he is also a lecturer at one of the colleagues in Bhutan and he has trained more than 1000 young people on SRHR, gender equality and human rights training. He also helped establish the YPR network in different uh, locations across Bhutan too. So Lekki, can you share, um, can you please share more about integrating SRHR and HIV and implementing uh, CSE in Asia and the Pacific as a critical issues to be prioritized in the new political declaration? So over to you. Yes, uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and thank you, Lekki, for uh, giving me this platform to share on integrating SRHR and HIV and implementing comprehensive sexuality education in the Asia and Pacific. Um, well, before I talk uh, in depth, let me go by the facts. So it is the fundamental human right actually to have uh, everyone access to education as the right to health and of course the right to sexuality, uh, sexuality education right to non-discrimination and right to privacy. So these are some of the fundamental human rights. But if we look into the current context, uh, if we ask ourselves if we really enjoy this kind of rights, then, then, then um, these are some of the questions that we can ask ourselves. The complexity of the bureaucratic shift and change within the relevant ministries, changes in the administrative and pedagogies are fueled and shared by a very strong religious strongholds, which provides or advise the morals, behaviors, and cultural code in the society. Therefore, these are some of the challenges that young people are facing at the moment. As I said, if we go by um, the facts, so around 63% of pregnant women aged between 15 to 19 in Asia Pacific um, are unattended, which often lead to underreported and burden of unsafe abortion, which is very high. Similarly, according, uh, similarly one in eight girls, that is around 19 million and one in 50 boys, which means 4 million aged between 15 to 19 years of age are currently married. And, and almost 27 million of young women aged between 20 to 24 are married within the age of 18, which is very alarming. So similarly, there are an estimated of 3.7 million births uh, to 15 to 19 years of girls in the Asia Pacific alone in the year 2019. So, so looking at all of these figures, um, it is very important we prioritize uh, the, the comprehensive sexual education in Asia and Pacific. 44% um, of girls and 45% of boys have not received any information about uh, their menstruation and, 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 and wet dreams. So majority of country, if we look into uh, today's contracts, majority of country uh, in the region have the laws and policies related to SRHR and sexuality education for young people. But the question here is, do we really have a non-judgmental comprehensive sexual policy? Do we have proper monitoring and evaluation system? And do we have existing law that covers CSC and their needs? If we look into this, then, then people say that only 28% of the young people, they say that uh, they feel that their school teaches them about sexuality, which indicates that we do not have education. Um, sexuality education in education management system. In Asia and Pacific, only 15% says that sexuality education is integrated in their education management system and 25% um, in secondary schools. Similarly, in the Pacific, uh, Pacific region, 38% in primary school and 50% in secondary school, which is very um, less. So, um, how are we doing uh, in the Asia Pacific? So we have been prioritizing uh, 
and the implementation of out of school comprehensive sexuality education and it was launched recently so we make sure that we reach out to every individual irrespective of their gender race cost so it's an inclusive and we try to reach young populations and marginalized uh, population um, by channelizing them uh, in a program in a general way so that the government and anti uh, sexual reproductive right do not obstacle so I have been doing uh, this similarly as most government in the region have agreed to implement comprehensive sexual education and SRHI education for young people, this can be one way uh, how we are focused on the knowledge related to HIV. So as I said, we must reach a marginalized uh, population by adding them into uh, general groups. Looking by the figure again, if we asked, uh, how satisfied are they with the sexual education that we have been providing or that the country have been providing in the region? The LGBT community says that they are totally dissatisfied, which means 65% says that they are dissatisfied. Similarly, uh, people living with dis uh, disability, they say that 56% um, of them say that they are dissatisfied and general youth, 47 says that they are totally dissatisfied. So uh, if we look into this, so we have been doing so many things in the region that people are dissatisfied at the same time. Therefore, it is very important we look into and institutionalize uh, comprehensive sexual education. We engage our teachers, uh, students, religious leaders, and even parents uh, when it comes to sexual education. So far, we have learned that um, people are taught about sexuality education, HIV and AIDS, but we are not taught about why and how we can prevent that. And that, therefore, YPA, as I said, have been um, um, prioritizing in implementing our school youth because most of them are unreached and we have been integrating young populations in many various ways by adding them to general public and and then we have been suggesting or the, the organization relevant organization have been suggesting it to make it as a curriculum and most of the uh, countries in the region they have agreed to have a uh, different uh, set of policies so I think um, I'll stop here and I'll wait for the, the questions, if any, and can be added in the question and answer session. Thank you, Lena. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. And thank you so much for all the speakers and we are so much appreciated to have you here in this panel. So now we're moving to the Q&A section and Firstly, jumping to the chat box, I would like to grab this opportunity to ask a couple of questions from Ambassador Dr. Stephanie Williams, and thank you so much for staying on with us. So my uh, first question will be, so we have witnessed that HLM political declaration haven't yet included the term young key population, and this is alarming because as per UNAIDS, 95% uh, of the total HIV infection amongst young people in Asia are from adolescents key populations. And however, the resource distribution is not proportional. So we are really urge Australia as the co-chair to facilitate the integration to young key population in the final political declaration. So my question is how can young key population groups at the regional and the global level support the co-chair to ensure that? Thanks um, for the question. I mean, I, I think young people and key populations are referred to in the zero draft of the declaration. And I, I saw Fletcher, I heard Fletcher's point about the distinction between adult key populations and young and youth key populations. As a, Australia in our role as co-chair is both a co-chair and a member state, um, which, which will be signing the declaration. So when we think about how do we push and be progressive and recognize a term like youth, uh, young key populations. Um, we, as a, it's much easier to be a facilitator if, if, of a particular decision or inclusion of YKP, if mem many member states are asking for the same thing. So my first point is that our groups, um, such as we have today, are also citizens of countries um, who are having a role as member states in this process and that there is a role for talking within countries to governments. And I know that's not 
easy in every country. But in the first instance, wherever we can get countries to say this is an important rec uh, population to recognise specifically in a declaration, then that is much. Then that makes it much easier for the co-chairs to facilitate adoption. Should the majority of member states want to see that progress, Australia as a member state is progressive on this issue. We really do support the response. The, um, how we need to be more responsive and recognition. And I was so encouraged to hear when Ika was talking before about since the last HLM, she has seen young people more involved in decision-making. So the words that are included do matter. But yeah, that would be my advice. Think of yourself as a, as a, a, a group, as a key population with a view, and then your own roles in own countries about how member states start to think about that as a uh, distinct, um, entity to be referenced in a declaration. I should say over, as we do on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I'm pretty agree with all the ideas. So the following that we have another question, um, which is how will the Australian government continue um, the support to HIV response and Yankee population in Asia and the Pacific after the adoption of the final HLM political declaration? So Australia has a long history of supporting the HIV response globally in the region and obviously in our own country. And co-facilitating the HLM is just one part of and a very important part of Australia's support to the HIV response. And words are important and they're critical in shaping how the um, normative standards apply to HIV, but as is our actions. And, and our actions following the HLM Australia continues to engage on the UNAIDS Program Coordinating Board to operationalise the global AIDS strategy. We are an ongoing contributor for the, to the Global Fund and in this phase, $242 million for the Global Fund over the three years from 2020 to 2022 and core funding to UNAIDS. So institutionally, our support is unwavering. Um, and then there are several local, uh, local uh, country and regional programs and projects that we continue to support. Um, my message is that we're in it for the long haul and uh, adapting the response um, to continue to drive improvements. But hearing from um, partners and hearing from uh, voices today is a really important part of how we shape an ongoing response to. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the, all, all the answers and the support on behalf of the Yankee population in Asia Pacific. So thanks um, Ambassador Dr. Um, Williams, so we'll stop here and uh, continue the question and answer for the panelists of, um, panelist of the first panel. So I've got uh, some questions from Eddie in the chat box. Um, so starting from Kalisita, we got a comment in the question about, thank you for sharing your experience and perspectives from the Pacific. My question is about intersectionality between climate change and SRHR. As we all know, Pacific Islands are extremely vulnerable to climate change and, and this will also impact how people can access services. Do you think we need to address climate change and HIV and its intersectionality and also how can young people be involved in making sure their health and their homes are protected? So Kalisita, can you answer? Uh, yeah, thank you so much for the question. And yes, I, uh, it's really, and it's a vital, uh, for the, uh, not only the Pacific, but the world, it is important to address the, the different intersectionalities between SRHR and climate change, because we have noticed as, as temperature goes higher, the, the rates of domestic of violence also increases, and we have so this, and we have noticed that young people, uh, young people, and our mothers, uh, who who the the different intersection, the different linkages between climate change and, and SRHR, because whenever they find fish, they have to go in the in the, in the Pacific. We are we are just uh, we are just the Pacific island countries are just. Uh, uh, we are surrounded by ocean, and ocean to us, the ocean and the land are very are two important uh, part of our, our, our livelihood. So when we have noticed that 
when young people and our, uh, our elders, whenever they go to the, to the ocean to get resources such as marine organisms, fish, they risk their lives, their bodily autonomy in getting these products, these fish products, uh, Aquatic products from the from the sea, from the sea itself, and we have noticed young people has been uh, we have uh, we, we have seen a lot of young people from the Pacific in taking the uh, who were at the front line of human of uh, climate justice rallies, for in Fiji in New Zealand and and it's like talking about the injustices of how colonization climate uh, and colonization and the, how these uh, colonial powers has, uh, have done, have, like, have, have made the risk of uh, many young people's, uh, people's life for, for generation. And we have noticed this with a lot of young people from the Pacific uh, in, in uh, the Marshall Islands, where they talk about nuclear justice and how, nucle how their sexual reproductive health rights are affected of nuclear testing done by the US. And talk about how they were born with how they were born as jelly baby, jelly bean babies, where they they the body the, of they have high risk to cancer, and not only the Marshall Islands. We also talk about French Polynesia, with the nuclear testing done by this former uh, done by this uh, British colony, uh, uh, these the colonies, this France, France, and Britain, and how they have. They, and the US, how they did uh, nuclear testing in the Pacific Island country, in, the, in this Pacific ter uh, Island territories. And you've seen young people at the front line advocating and pushing for, um, and it's been pushing for the interlinked climate justice. Because when we, because we believe that our, my fish is your fish. What the, because, the, because of the ocean, we all, we all share the ocean and like, if climate and the need of climate change, it's really important to that to address climate justice and the different level of uh, intersectionalities that you can you cannot talk about one uh, SRHR without talking about climate justice, decolonization of the body, and HIV. And it's really it's a really and it's to me and it's a very important issue because it always and we see leaders while uh, first world countries in that. Uh, in the air con room here in the Pacific, we are drowning because of climate justice. And it's vital to address climate justice and all issues. Because you can you cannot talk about one issue without meaning without talking the other level of oppression being done. Naka, thank you. Um thank you so much. Calicito. So moving to another question that I've got Fletcher, it is um, the civil society space is shrinking and youth organization and networks are um, often the first to go specifically um, since COVID-19. How do we ensure youth networks survive in this pandemic? Okay, sure. Um, thank you so much for the questions. So on my second part, sharing the experience, um, some example from the youth organizations practice. So we're seeing the promising program implemented by young people and the youth led organization in our region. But I also mentioned that um, related to, to this question that assessing large donor funds remaining a, a challenge for smaller um, youth led organization and networks in our region because the limited capacity and experience and also um, the criteria for um, that application, because um, oft, often that a lot of um, international found require that um, organization or network to have the experience to handling certain amounts of money and youth organization doesn't have that capacity to really apply for those found. So we understand that donor might feel safe to work in the organization that they um, work for a long time. But if the organization, if the donors and international, do international donor or the government feel that the, the program, the project implemented by the youth organization, youth that organization are really practical and promising, then, and then maybe you should start um, like doing consultation with youth that organization and youth networks to really sit down with them to um, ask them what kind of um, application process, what kind of criteria would be easier, would be uh, really fit for the youth that organization to apply for. And also I think the supporting and the mentoring on the capacity to really move on um, the 
um, organizational development is also a key on this issue. So I, I guess this is alarm to the international donor and also um, the government because we are seeing like some of the country in our region, they have a challenging environment. Um, they don't even have the um, like um, criteria to apply for domestic funding or domestic funding. It doesn't even exist for a key population, young key population in their country. So um, how do we ensure youth network survived is that we try to advocate with the uh, international donor to that and see what um, the smaller program implemented in the country are really worth um, like implementing, investing a lot. So I guess I will stop here and let um, the speaker answer another questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fletcher. I'm pretty agree with all the points you've mentioned. And due to time strict, that's the um, very last question for the Q&A. It is for the Leahy. And the YPR network in Bhutan is very strong and young people seem to care a lot about their reproductive health and right. How can we replicate this as the best practice and continue to advocate for SRHR and HR at the regional level. So, uh, <clears throat> Well, thank you very much. So, Bhutan, uh, as a culturally different country, it is at times very difficult to talk about sexual reproductive health right and comprehensive sexuality education, uh, I mean, concepts in family. We say, we believe that it is not right to talk about sexual education and HIV and AIDS um, in the family. So YPA Bhutan uh, have a very uh, unique concept wherein uh, with the support from donor uh, funding agencies and and, and, and partners with all the schools, I mean, colleges uh, in the country, we have institutionalized the government support. The government have institutionalized um, YBA in all the colleges. So the colleges, they have a unit, separate unit, wherein the needs and the needs around sexual and reproductive health rights are taken care. But because we believe in peer education, as I said, Bhutan being, uh, we at times mix uh, culture, tradition, and sexual education. And we think that it's, it's not right to talk about. So in a way, um, the, the government have very strong support towards young people and we have institutionalized and, and the system is put in place where every colleges in the country, they have a YPA unit, which means the peer to peer um, uh, approach has been uh, followed. So in a way, like this is the best practice. Similarly, the monitoring and evaluation system that we have from uh, institute level and government level is very strong. Uh, although, uh, of course, we have uh, support from donor agencies such as UNICEF, UNFPA, and other funding agencies such as Asia Pacific, uh, YPA. So this is how we have been doing. And I think it's, it's, it's uh, more effective to have it institutionalized and the system put in place so that every youth enjoys uh, equal right to sexual education. Okay, thank you, yeah. Um As a moderator, I want to ask one more question since you've got two. Um, so it's a when um, of, we've got a comment that con wonderful sharing. Is there any plan to standardize and inclusive um, sexual reproductive health education in school across the Asia Pacific, as we are now seeing the huge gaps of knowledge between the progressive versus conservative re uh, religious countries. Can you give a very brief uh, um, answer on that? Yeah, so uh, if I may have understood correctly, how far are we going to implement or standardize sexual education in the region? Right. So as I've said, uh, many countries in the region, they have agreed to have laws that will take care of uh, comprehensive sexual education in the region. Uh, and then uh, if we go by the research, the fact shows that only 28% of people, they feel that the education is taught in the school, which means there's a huge gap. So now the only recommendation may be a kind of suggestion or the young uh, uh, as a young youth advocate, what we wanted to see is we wanted to have a law 
the law mandatory. We have to have a mandatory law in the region that makes sure that comprehensive sexuality education is made uh, as a part of education curriculum. Of course, we have uh, the laws and policies that take care of the comprehensive sexuality education uh, in the region, but it is not that holistic as per the research. Therefore, we wanted to make sure that or we request all the, 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 the stakeholders in the country and all the policymakers to have a very strong law that mandates comprehensive sexuality education in the uh, region. Similarly, um, in the in the Asia and Pacific FP generally look, we are taught about sex and sexual education, but we are not taught about how should we do sexual intercourse, what are good and bad, what is sexual discrimination, what is what. So these are some of the topics that we never talk of. We know um, why people go to move. I mean, we know that people are going to move, but we don't know why they are going. So similarly, uh, we know how to have sex because people now are getting access to all sorts of materials from YouTube and Google and internet because of the internet. So people think at times get stereotyped and then they mislead themselves. So in a way, like we really want stakeholders and policymakers to focus on why concept and make it mandatory uh, to have sexual education from the very base because it's understood that uh, body changes and all these things requirements happens from the very primary uh, level, I think. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nikki. Thank you so much. Thank you so much um, for all um, speakers for the beautiful conversation and then sharing impressive speeches with us. And thank you so much for the um, ambassador, um, Ambassador Dr. Williams. And we're so appreciative for that. I wish it wasn't have any time limit, but unfortunately, this panel is about to end. Thanks all to the speakers again, um, and to all participants who have asked very important questions. So with that, um, I would like to invite the next panel moderator, Hani Luster, Program Implementation and m and &E Officer at the UNDP Bangkok Regional Hub. So over to you. Thank you, Neke, thank you. Well, it's such a pleasure to be moderating today. And I am so grateful to have heard uh, from the young, amazing young advocates so far. Uh, in this next panel, we will be joined by three inspiring young leaders who will share their thoughts, experience and priorities on the meaningful engagement and participation of YKP in the lead up to the high level meeting. This includes stories of activism from Indonesia, Philippines and India. I'd also like to encourage everyone on the Facebook Live to keep sharing your questions and engage. Um, and so to begin, we have Irene Audrey. I'd like to welcome Irene. Irene is from Indonesia and she is a member of the Youth Lead Network and is currently working as a secretary for Inti Muda. Inti Muda is the National Young Key Population Network. Inti Muda is based in Jakarta, but also has local networks across the country. She's also a representative of young women who use drugs. So Irene, I would like to ask you, from the perspective of a YKP, what are the priorities for the high level meeting? and what issues specifically should be prioritized for young key populations. Over to you, Irene. Thank you for joining us today. Doing this HLM uh, is to have explicit action in the political declaration to answer the priority issues of YKP. YKP. I have a few key issues to be part of the priority. Uh, one is age of consent. The rate uh, of disengagement from careless among youth people aged 15 to 24 years living with HIV <clears throat> is almost twice in comparison to that of young people uh, 10 to 14 years or adult over 25 years. There are still many adolescents who do not have to access to sexual health service and HIV service due to laws that act as barrier to accessing HIV testing, treatment, and prevention, such as age of consent, laws for accessing uh, testing uh, uh, that uh, restrict access to harm reduction service. If we don't well uh, reduce the age of consent, we won't be able to achieve the first goal. Uh, two, repealing of uh, restrictive and punitive uh, laws policies. Young people demand the discrimination of drug users, sex worker, 
lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer people living with HIV and AIDS. Anti-discrimination laws must be enacted and enforced in all countries of the world in order to ensure that PLHIV in all their uh, diversity, uh, diversities enjoy their, hum, uh, enjoy their human rights. Sorry. Three, economic empowerment. Providing RRV, uh, ARV drugs to PLHIV in their various diversity is not sufficient for them to be virally sup uh, suppressed. Taking IRV drugs on an empty stomach can cause harmful effects, providing nutritional support to adolescent and young people, adolescent girl and young woman living with HIV is important. And also um, young key population, orphans and vulnerable children living with the virus. Thus, we need to economically empower PLHIV, the various diversity in order from the, them to priority their basic needs and life, healthy life. And funding. Without funding, the various network of people living with HIV in their various country, this won't be achieved. We argue you to please fund the organization directly and not funding through other channel from them to receive money. It will be difficult for them to access this money due to process and political barrier of those organizations. Please uh, provide sustainable funding for youth-led response without uh, restrictive and uh, burdensome application and reporting process. Uh, lastly, allow us to design our own program and allow us to implement them. I promise there will only uh, be the best outcome. Thank you all and please stay safe and accept my warm regret. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Thank you so much for sharing. And uh, something that you said that really struck me was uh, the priority on uh, economic empowerment for people living with HIV um, and not just access to medication. Uh, so thank you for raising that um, as a priority. So next we have John Michael Uwanu from the Philippines. John is a youth and HIV advocate and a John of Pinoy Plus, Pinoy Plus, a people's organization of Filipinos living with HIV and AIDS. He is also a member of Youth Voices Count and a live support group. He also acts as a representative of young people living with HIV at the United Nations Youth Advisory Board in the Philippines. John, so my question for you is, what are YKP is doing to ensure meaningful engagement and participation in the HLM? And are there any youth-led uh, initiatives you could share with me? Thank you, John. Thank you. So I'm John Michael Wano from the Philippines. So YKPs are joining to different platforms where they can execute their skills, knowledge, and share the experiences. These experiences are the way for us to know what our needs and what action we want in order to address the issues and concerns pertaining to HIV and AIDS. Like in the Philippines, calling for amendment of Republic Act 8504, consultation with the young key population for creating the implementing rules and regulation for Philippine HIV and AIDS Policy Act of 2018, National Young People's Planning Forum on HIV and AIDS or NYPPF, creating the learning materials for teachers and learners for comprehensive sexuality education and calling for its implementation. Support from different youth-led organizations for YKPs and young people living with HIV. And more initiatives coming from young people that are creating a big impact in HIV and AIDS. Initiative that comes from young key, uh, young key people are a sign that we need to step up our game. We know the market because we are the market. More and visible representation of young key population on HLM is really needed. The experiences of young key population can determine where we need to put more actions. Skills and innovation from us can make this action works and save space for us to tell the stories, experiences, and to acknowledge our action is what we need on, on the HLM. Those actions are very vital and that ensures our participation to HLM. Being part of the community, we know what we need and what we want. We are the one who are experiencing the challenges of accessing the HIV services and commodities, such as having getting tested because of stigma, 
correct information about HIV and AIDS, information about testing and treatment, and accessing to condoms and lubricants of young key populations. We are also the one who are calling the attention to provide to us the services that we deserved. Young key population plays an important role at, H at high level meeting. So we need to make sure our spaces for dialogue are youth friendly, inclusive, accessible, and, support and supportive to the needs of the young key population. Our participation is very needed and critical in decision-making where the YKPs will be affected. Young key population are giving their heart and soul to advocacy to provide the services and safe, a safe place for the young people, especially for the younger ones. Support, acknowledgement, and safe space, space, uh, safe space for us is what we need. This time is the right time to take action, to make a move, and through meaningful engagement and participation at high, at high level meeting of young key population, we can make our community a stigma and, dis and discrimination free community, a place of love, hope, and peace. Thank you so much. Maraming salamat po. Thank you so much, uh, John. Um, I love the phrase that you just said, we know the market because we are the market. And thank you for highlighting the importance of youth-friendly and accessible safe spaces to voice the challenges that YKPs face. I think we all know that young people especially those present here today are, are willing to uh, speak out. And so those spaces need to be provided and they need a, a seat at the table as it were. And I hope that the stakeholders present today will really take this on board and take this forward. Mm -hmm. And so our final speaker of today's panel is Shinmei Modi. Shinmei Modi is from India and he is a young person who was born and living positively with HIV. He is a former board member of the Global Network of People Living with HIV and a current board member of Youth Lead, the Asia Pacific Network of Young Key Populations. He is also a programs advisor at the Global Network of Youth Living with HIV and Y Plus Global. So Tinmay, thank you for joining us today. And if I may ask you, what are the next steps? It's a big question, but what are the next steps? What support is needed from governments and stakeholders to ensure that young people are effectively engaged in the HIV response? Over to you, Shinmei. Thank you so much, honey. Uh, uh, I would first say thank you so much, everyone, for, for giving me this opportunity to talk. And of course, the major part that what are our needs? Uh, we definitely need uh, uh, a handholding support right now from, from the government and stakeholders because uh, this is like the important part of our, of, of, of our discussion. Uh, my areas of concern is like, like we need more commitment and emphasis from young key population and young people living with HIV in Asia and Pacific, as the highest infection is still recorded among the vulnerable population. Also, we are leaving uh, our people from, uh, from the grassroots. They are leaving, they are left behind. Uh, they are the hidden population who choose to stay confidential from the society. Only supporting them with treatment is not going to help us to achieve our agenda. Uh, we also require a more evidence-based planning and inclusive program programming with uh, young key population and young people living with HIV as epidemic is increasing in the group. Lack of data or no data about young people living with HIV is the biggest gap to our movement. Uh, we, do, we do talk about needs, progress, as well as achievements, but we also need a review or a mechanism of whatever way we commit is implemented or not. Youth commitments were present in 2016 political declaration, but there is a lack of progress or evidence in this new political declaration. So we also need to see if whatever we are planning is, is being implemented uh, or not. Also, when we talk about, um, about community led, there is a lack of meaningful, meaningful involvement of young key population and young people living with HIV, including women, uh, as well as gra grassroots prepare, uh, people and in the declaration. There is no mention of GPA, but I would rather say that we, we also need ethical engagement as well as meaningful engagement of young people living with HIV in, in, uh, in all the decision making process. Because tokenist, tokenistic approach for young people living with HIV as well as young key population is, is not at all the solution now. Uh, also, if we talk about the political declaration, uh, and right now currently the COVID-19 has hit us so hard, that mental health has affected a lot. But if we see the declaration, it talks about uh, mental health of people who is above the age of 50 years. But it is really important that we also focus on 
young people living with hiv and young key population uh, who are who are like dealing with depressions and, and other sort of mental health um, emergencies uh, because of the situation as well as because of uh, they are, they are not able to reach or they are not able to access services uh, which is very much required uh, required from 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 their end uh, apart from that uh, if i talk of uh, 2016 political declaration of hlm there was the inclusion of young people but there is no data of progress gaps in 2021 zero declaration draft and also limited to one or two commitment for young people and young population so in order to ensure the implementation of commitment and progress in rewards to ykp and ypl hiv hlm must include young people uh, also need more commitment and support from 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 my own country government as well uh because like we get support from uns india as well as national aids control organization from our country but the ground realities are very different from what we discuss at the national level specific youth youth focus initiatives are need of an hour for india also i would like to uh, say that donors funders and stakeholders uh, who who are right now present in this in this uh, discussion um uh, they should also consider the 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 takes which have been given by my my previous colleagues like the people from intimuda as well as the person um, uh, from from the first panel the the importance of of their sharing was uh, is so important that you know we should take uh, we should we request you all to take uh, those points into account with the with the highest importance also uh, further i would like to request that issues and agenda discussed by my colleagues uh, should also be taken into account by 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 the people from uh, from high level meeting as well as for, for, as well as for um, and the people from from the different parts of the countries where uh, where uh, people are still struggling with uh, with with hiv as well as um, uh, other related problems uh, also i would like to conclude that the time has changed now and ykp and ypl hiv are important and unavoidable part of the movement we have the potential to prove our ability and existence to bring the change we need thank you so much thank you so much tinmay and and thank you for raising some really serious um uh issues and priorities that we need to take forward uh something that you said which um i'm really grateful for is looking at the impact of mental health um and making sure that um it focuses on the impact of mental health um and on young people um and making sure that their different uh issues that they face and their type of mental health emergencies um are uh, especially addressed um and also you said something about um having the government on board and having national governments on board and i think this is important for other stakeholders um who are in positions of power to listen to and help facilitate uh those uh networks and those relationships right um and so with that i'd like to invite all of our um three panelists back uh for a very quick q and a session so may i have irene we, i think we can all, that's i mean there's space for all four of us right so let's have all four of us back on the screen so we can have a conversation uh so this question is for irene and also I mean it's a question directed to Irene but if anyone else would also like to um uh make a comment please feel free to to jump in as well. Um so this is for Irene. Uh someone has said thank you for talking about young people who use drugs. What are some of the main challenges for young people who use drugs especially if they are in school? Many young people are expelled or criminalized and don't receive fair treatment. Do you think the government of Indonesia will raise this issue for people who use drugs? Over to you Irene. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, there are students who are drop out uh, of school for using drug. The main challenge uh, for young people who use who use drugs, uh, indeed, if those uh, young people who use drugs are in school, they will uh, drop out from the school. And it's so hard to talk about uh, drug user in Indonesia um, because. Uh, our country, uh, the religion and culture, and also we might end up uh, in jail uh, if advocate openly for young people who use drugs. I don't know for sure if the government will help uh, this because uh, drugs are related to the law. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, and so my next uh, question is for John. Uh, so John, if I may ask you, one of the core barriers faced by young key populations in the Asia and Pacific region is the age of consent for HIV testing. 
In 2018, the Philippine government decided to make it a law for minors age 15 to 18 to get tested for the HIV, one moment, for the, uh, for HIV. This will significantly empower youngsters to get HIV testing earlier and start their medication early. From your knowledge, was this impactful? Do you think more young people now are accessing HIV testing? So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on it. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, this uh, impactful. Many young people are always asking if they can have to, uh, if they can have uh, HIV test despite of their age. And now they can have the chance to check their HIV status. Um, the problem or the concern that we need to uh, to to need to focus on is the prom uh, promoting and providing uh, more information uh, regarding to this. So thank you. Thank you, John. I completely agree. Access to information is so vital. Access, access to accurate information um, is very vital. And I think we all as a community working on these issues need to come together and make sure that that information is being um, distributed uh, properly. Uh, so my next question is for Chinwe. Um, and so someone has said, thank you so much for sharing your expectation, your expectation, Chinmay, and good points. Uh, they said that they agree that we need more to say about young people in the zero draft. Also, right now, we see the news about India and COVID-19. How do you think this will impact the HIV response and how young people stay engaged when the focus is more on COVID-19? Yeah. I, I definitely agree and I would like to like, like to share this, you know, uh, it is the biggest challenge for young people, uh, young population as well as young people living with HIV in India that we don't have a national platform right now, which, you know, like young people can directly put their words um, or put their concerns in front of in front of um, the government or in front of um, uh, any other stakeholders because, you know, we don't have a youth network that is the that is the biggest challenge for us. Uh, as well as we don't have a constant communication or you know constant uh, platform where we can just put our words or put our uh, our voice in front of uh, the stakeholders so it is really a big challenge for for young people uh, living with hiv and in young key populations to uh, to constantly engage or you, you know to constantly put forward their uh, their their concerns uh, but if if uh, if they want to get uh, involved or if they want to get more focus about for HIV. And then the only thing is like we should we should keep pushing our needs. We should keep pushing our ideas and agendas to to the people, to the decision makers. That you know, young people has to be involved in the discussion. Uh, young people has to be involved in the decision making process. And this is the high time that uh, young people living with HIV are to be given much more importance than just a protagonistic approach, um, uh, which 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 currently is which currently it somehow is a problem. Uh, and also, I would like to request that during the time of COVID-19, uh, if we think of young people, then we definitely need some intervention and we definitely need some uh, initiatives to, to, to be focused on young people living with HIV here in India. May it be a quality counseling right now because it is very important or may it be any other agenda uh, with regards to young people living with HIV. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chinwe. Um... Is that, is that our final question? Just checking with the admins. If that is the final question, is there any, is there any final statements that anyone would like to, to say in our um, panel, especially having heard your, your peers? Does anyone have any final words? Especially uh, now that the HLM is very close. Irene, any final words? No. Oh, okay, that's fine. <laughs> thank you so much. No, no, no. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for such a fantastic and engaging panel, everyone. Um, so next on the agenda, um, we have a closing. Uh, so, so if I may, I'd like to pass the mic over to Abigail Amon from uh, Youth Voices Count and Vanessa Monley from Youth Lead for their reflections and closing. Thank you so much. Um, okay, good day everyone. So I'm Abigail Amon. Uh, I'm from the Youth Voices Account Regional Secretariat. So alongside my co-presenter, Vanessa, we are happy to provide the recap of the current situation of the YK, YKPs and the steps that need to be done moving forward 
with regards to the HLM 2021 and the political declaration. So we have established that youth, women, LGBT and PLHIV communities are key populations whose needs must be addressed in our regional response. So our engagement is important in the UNAIDS high-level meeting. Uh, our programs need to be redesigned to fit, to fit to the needs of the communities. So on setting the scene, um, access to CSE, comprehensive sexuality education, remains the concern. HIV services and access to testing are currently being innovated by young key populations. We use the social media platforms. We integrate mobile testing vans in order to help uh, provide access um, to the services. Our, our regional orgs, such as YVC, um, Youth Lead, and YPeer, uh, continue to work actively to get funds from bigger donors and create programs that especially help smaller youth organizations. Barriers such as decriminalization of drugs and sex work and laws that step on the rights of LGBT and field HIV must also be addressed. Um, it's important to note that AIDS should not just be a public health response, but also a societal response. In terms of inclusion, sex remains a taboo topic, so this is setting a pushback in our programs. Young people instead turn to the internet for answers, which possibly do not promote proper and safe education. So facilities should be sensitive and inclusive to uh, avoid the stigmatization of LGBTIQ communities, um, so that these services are accessible to these communities. Geography also remains an issue alongside violence and hate crime. Um, and these human rights violations must be acknowledged and addressed in our regional response. We have to also remember that the discussion on gender must be decolonized so that the response becomes more inclusive and can help reach the most oppressed sectors. In the bigger picture, many minorities remain dissatisfied by the current programs that exist. A lot of societal bar barriers include rel religious strongholds um, that uh, are faced by key populations. We need to ask, do we really have non-judgmental CSE programs and do we really have inclusive laws? So uh, for establishing priorities, a few points have been brought up from age of consent to repealing of restrictive and discriminatory policies to economic empowerment and also, um, it is important to fund organizations directly so that they can have direct access to the support that they need. And we must allow ourselves, the youth, to design our own program. Um, as for the meaningful engagement and participation in the high-level meeting 2021, um, alongside um, the next steps moving forward, uh, I would like to call on to Vanessa, my co-presenter, to uh, continue the discussion of the closing. Thank you so much, Abigail. So just to add on, uh, although the high-level meeting is a global arena, regional issues unique to the Asia-Pacific tend to be generalized and the nuances of the regions such as the HIV epidemic and the key population led response get lost at the global level. So therefore, it is critical to keep advocating for young key population issues that are specific to this region. This can be done through partnerships and how we move forward in the lead up to the, H uh, to the HLM. So the report that will be disseminated from today's virtual meeting will be an advocacy tool and an opportunity to voice what young key populations still require from the government. So this report will be shared with the regional representatives and the youth representatives of the multi-stakeholder task force to ensure that young key population issues are reaching that global arena. Based on the shared experiences today of young leaders and advocates from the region, it is clear that the needs of young key populations are still not being met. So we ask the government representatives in attendance today to utilize this report from the meeting to not only advocate for the needs of young people and young key populations, but recognize them as experts and leaders in the HIV response. The government can stand by young people and young key populations by making it mandatory that they're included in the delegations and programming. So it can be hard for young people to engage in high level meeting matters due to the technical language barriers, which leads some young key populations at a disadvantage. Therefore, it is crucial for agencies such as UNAIDS and National AIDS Commission to keep providing these type of platforms for young people to voice their concerns as well as commitment and financial support. So how we strategically move from this meeting involves proactive partnerships from the multi-stakeholder task force, government, UNAIDS, and collective youth groups. Whether this be potential side events at the high level meeting or getting involved and in pushing as many advocacy campaigns on the concerns of young key populations from the age of 
And as Ambassador Williams earlier mentioned, as youth civil society, we have a critical role to play in making sure progressive language, young key population needs, and community-led responses are recognized by member states at the high-level meetings. And to quote the young people's response to the zero draft of the political declaration, we call on member states to actively and meaningfully engage young people in negotiations to drive progressive and radical systemic reform that will allow accelerated action to end AIDS by 2030. Thank you. Handing over back to the UNAC. Thank you very much, Vanessa, for your powerful words. Such a good way to close uh, this uh, excellent uh, virtual event. I would like to hand over to Eamon for uh, a closing, quick closing remarks. Eamon, over to you. Thank you very much um, uh, to the many um, panelists, but um, importantly also to the many people who sent questions in. Facebook Live is very active with um, comments, but importantly, the messages from the diverse range of panelists is really going to be important to both get that message out to people to think about. But as we heard both from um, Ambassador Williams and we just heard from uh, Vanessa at the end, critical for us is that access to the delegations, access to your governments with the messages you need them to take forward. Both positive messages about young key populations engagement and, and the importance of it, but then also the, cha the challenges still to be addressed. Because if you're going to influence the political declaration and through your governments, you need them to be able to make positive statements about why it's important to address um, uh, and, and work with young key populations. Um, if we come just with an ask all the time about problems, then it, it doesn't always get through that political layer and filter. So think strategically about how to give them some positive messages about and, and why they would want to make sure that young key populations and needs are recognised. The economic impact of young people in the community, the size of the population, a whole range of other things not just HIV and, and young key pops. Um, and, and that's why um, uh, whatever the relevant message in your country that you think would help you get um, uh, the foreign ministry on board through the Ministry of Health sometimes, but directly the foreign ministry um, to, to raise these issues because it's the delegations in the New York missions, the embassies of your countries in New York that will negotiate. And they're currently doing that today. The second day of the first reading is today. And then there will be a pause while all the countries go back and consult. And then they'll come back to a second reading and then a third. Um, so it's a negotiation process. Great to see such strong messages. Get out there, get your voice heard in, in countries. Call on our officers in your country if, if they can help you. Um, and let's make sure that your messages are, are, are well understood. Thank you everybody for organizing this great event. Uh, our partners from um, both the governments of Thailand and Australia, but more importantly, the, the youth networks, the three working with the many different partners that we've got here. Thanks, Michaela and team, um, back to you. Thank you very much. So I wish you a good afternoon, good evening, and I thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, the live stream's been ended, I think. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. 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 Have a good day.